Romans chapter 7. Now, before we stand for the reading of the word of the Lord, uh, putting things into perspective a little bit, as you know, we, um, we've been going through the book of Romans, and we come to a place now where uh, in chapter one, Paul defined for all of us that there are none righteous, no, not one. He went through all of Romans chapter one, defining all these areas, and we could find ourselves in the midst of chapter one. And then he goes on to say, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And and we come to a place where we recognize that. And then he he goes through a a very clear depiction of this concept of justification, which we've studied in four, five, and six, actually four and five. and, and, And we see in justification, this idea that just as if I'd never sinned, but we added a new aspect to that, that when God looks at us in our sin and we receive by faith, we're justified by faith in Christ like Abraham and David, two men that, you know, you look at David's life, he was a murderer, an adulterer, um, and a liar, and God justified him by faith. You see with Abraham, he failed, God justified him by faith. He was righteous by faith. And so this concept of justification, just as if I'd never sinned, is that It's not anything we've done, it's what Christ has done. And by faith, we receive his propitiation, his forgiveness of our sins, cast him as far as east is from the west to be remembered no more. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see us in our sin, he sees us in his son's righteousness. We've been covered by the blood of the lamb. Well, that's kind of a cool thing because we have a a relinking, and that's where we get the term religion, relongari, to relink, reconnect with God. We have this relinking with God, not out of what we've done, but what Christ has done. So we're never uh, on this this, uh, endless rat wheel of trying to, uh, you you know, appease a capricious God and and trying to earn favor with him by what we do or don't do. Um, We have a right standing with God because of what Christ has done. And that's what separates Christianity from every religion in the world. Every religion in the world is man's attempt trying to appease uh, a, an angry God or to appease and do something to earn favor with him. When in reality, all we've done is by faith received his forgiveness and we've been reconciled, relinked to God, reconnected to God the Father. And we have a right relationship with him just as if I'd never sinned. Now justified is cool because we stand before him, our sins have been cleansed and God looks at us and he says, I, I, you know, to be remembered no more. Um, it's, it's like the idea of the preacher um, that, that had a, a deep-seated secret of, of something he had done while he was in seminary and uh, burdened by this, this deep sin that he had never confessed. And a woman came up to him and said, I have the gift of prophecy and God has told me that there's something hidden in your life. And his heart started to pound, oh goodness, um, please don't reveal this. But he said, uh, what is it? And she said, well, the Lord has called me to ask him about that. And he said, well, then I'll know if you have this gift of prophecy, if you can tell me what it is. And so the next week comes and he's laying awake, scared to death. And the woman approaches him and he's burdened by it. And, and he says, what is the sin? Did God tell you? And, and the Lord said, he has forgotten it. He doesn't remember it. And that's the idea for us is that God has cast it as far as east is from the west to be remembered no more. Now, the other exciting thing about justification is, are you ready for this? This is a cool one. It's a legal standing. That not only does he not remember it, but everything you've done, this is, this is crazy. Stay with me. Everything you've done is right. How about that? So I've shared with you stories about my life and my failure, and I've, I've got plenty of those. I could preach another 20 years and still not even reach the depths of those. But as I share those with you, it touches your life because you see the illustration. And it's not pleasant for me to revisit those, but they belong to God. And as I share those, he's made them in such a way that he's used them together for good. And he's made them right. So that you see the illustration and what God has done and it touches your life. And when you share the same things about your life with others, God uses them together for good. You're in right standing with God. He takes your past, as it says in Psalm 23, goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. It's the coachman of life that you say, God, but what about, and you turn behind you to talk about all the things, your failures, you turn around and you see goodness and mercy, these coachmen behind you just sweeping up the mess, just sweeping it up. And all you see behind you is goodness and mercy. You you think, God, how did you do that? How did you take all my failures and all my trials and all my miseries and use them together for good? 
And he just said, I know the beginning from the end and all points in between. I have this ability to, to use what Satan intended for evil and use it together for good. That Only God can do that. So we have a right standing with him. And now that brings us to a place where we go, well, wait a minute. If that's true, that everything I've done is not only forgotten, but he's turned it for good, I've got my get out of hell free card. I have a right relationship with God, amen? Why not just continue being an idiot? And just sin it up because it's gonna work together for good, right? And the apostle Paul says, you know, shall I continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul says, certainly not. His point is, is that when you've become a new creature in Christ and the old has passed and the new has come, what has happened is you've been born again. Man is a trichotomy, a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. Soul is the mind or the intellect. Body is the soma, the, the physical flesh. And, and the spirit is the pneuma. And when we sinned against God, the spirit departed and we were a, 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 a dichotomy, a two-part being. And what happened is the flesh took over and started to dictate to the mind what we were supposed to do. And the flesh is, is that seated desire. And desire is always greater than the intellect. And we think about that. I mean, I, I can find people in here with PhDs. And, and you, you, it's like Einstein. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And here we have folks in here who have PhDs and they find themselves going, I fell for it again. I can't believe it. I knew it. I had logically laid it out and I still did it. And you just keep doing the things you don't want to do. And you wonder, I, intellectually, intellectually, I know that if I do this, this happens. And I still do this. Because the intellect doesn't have as great a power as the desire, which sits on the throne of your life. Desire is greater than intellect. And so we have these, these longings and these desires, and that's why love just knocks people off their feet and they do stupid things. Maybe I'm only talking to myself. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and, and, and you find yourself in a place going, well, wait a minute, I had these desires, they overcame my intellect. I knew that if I'd done this, I was gonna be in a mess, and I find myself in that same mess. And, and so we come to this struggle, and that's where Paul talks about sanctification sanctification, realigning our lives in the manner in which God always intended us to operate. Not that the desire would overcome the intellect, where the body, the flesh, would overcome the intellect. But what happens is a realigning that when we're a new creature in Christ and by faith we receive Christ as our savior, we're born again, we're born anew, we're a new creature. And what happens is the spirit now takes precedent over our life, dictates to our psyche, our mind, our intellect, what our body, our desires are supposed to do. And we're aligned to operate in a capacity that brings good to the world around us. Instead of living where our desires just destroy everything. Because quite honestly, our desires do destroy us oftentimes. Not that we're to dismiss them. We, we believe in the beauty of humanity and, and, the, and, and to express all the intricacies and the joy that we have. We don't want to just be robots. God gives us music to express humanity and, and all, but it's all aligned in such a way to bring glory to him. The spirit dictates to the mind what the body will do. And we're realigned in such a way, having been born again, that we see this concept of sanctified. And sanctified means... It's like justification, only different, means set apart. Instead of doing things for ourself, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, be a servant of all. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow the Lord. And so sanctified means we're now set apart. We've been born again, purchased by the blood of Christ, set apart to do his bidding, not our own. It's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me, to will and to do of his good pleasure. Our lives are then given over. We're all slaves. Everybody in the room is a slave. You're either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. Some of you go, I'm no slave to anybody. Yes, you are. I can guarantee you are. Just give me a, let me just go spend time with your family at a funeral and I'll show you. Just, I'll get to get into the nook and cranny and see the relationships between you and your folks and your siblings and your nieces and your nephews. It won't take long. I'll see what triggers you and trips you and all the things that affect you. And everybody is a slave to something either slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. You got the loop of your parents in your head, you just can't get out and it, and it affects you and here you are in your later stages of life and, and those simple words they can say, you can just see how it cringes somebody. And yet God says, I've come that you might have life and life more abundant. I wanna realign your life, set you apart for my purposes, give you a new lease on life. 
that give you life, life more abundant, that everything works together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And all of a sudden you say, I want that, God. I'm tired of making a mess of this. I want to be set apart for your purposes, sanctified. Remember the story with Tinkerbell and the plate, my dog? That plate was sanctified, set apart for her. Nobody else eats on that. It may look clean, but it's filled, filled with microbes. Our life is set apart for God's use and we're instruments of righteousness, realigned with the spirit, the soul, and the body. Not that our desires are taking over and killing everything. Why is it that somebody would inject into their body a substance that would cause them to, to step out of reality and destroy their family, lose their job, steal from their loved ones, why would they do that? Because desire is greater than the intellect. And God says, I'm gonna give you a desire that will overcome these worldly desires, a desire for me and for my purposes in your life. And all of a sudden, everything is realigned and blessed. Now, with all that said, the Apostle Paul has been taking an enormous amount of time to, to use I, the word I, which is ego. Ego is self-preservation, right? I wanna protect myself. From, from being hurt. I want to protect myself, and it's all about me. And Paul says, I, the Apostle Paul, and he says for all of us to use the same way, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. To will and to do of his good pleasure. I die, Christ lives. I die, Christ lives. And that's what makes the world a better place. We're not all gathered here because we want to be better me's. I came here because I was sick of me. I wanted to be around people who were sick of themselves as well. We wanted something different. I've been around all of you when Christ isn't present, and you're not pleasant. <laughs> and you're saying the same of me. I've been around you, especially folks who work on staff. Yeah, Rob showed up today. That was a real treat. We all have that inside of us. We have this, this sin nature. It's there. And so Paul is going to give us a President Obama speech in chapter 7. When I say a President Obama speech, he's going to use I, me, 40 times <laughs> in his message. 40 times in chapter 7, he's going to say I and me. Have you ever heard President Obama? Always me, always I, always about him. Well, Paul doesn't do it in that capacity. Paul has something special to say about himself. And so with that, we're going to begin in chapter 7 at verse 14. Please stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. I'm also going to read into chapter 8, uh, into chapter 8, just a few verses, four of them to be exact. Romans 7, verse 14, Paul speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. I don't just do it, I practice it. I've perfected it. I'm really good at it. Okay, good. <laughs> Verse 20, now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. What Paul is saying is there's two people here. A person that I don't want to be anymore and the one that I am. And, and, and this, this betrayer, He's, he's with me and I want to get rid of him. So let's see what he says. Verse 21. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, exclamation point. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. 
There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Everyone stop and look at me. Don't look at the text because the text screws it up. There's a period after that. And look at me while I'm reading this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Just meditate on that. If you're a believer, you're not condemned. Okay? Now that's important. And then the authors added this little extra section. It's, it's true, but they added it. It says, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That's a good way to look at it. And then we'll finish with three more verses. Verse two, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to to the spirit. It'll all make sense. Hang in there. Lord, we ask your blessing upon the study of your word. I pray that you prepare us to receive all that you have for us and help us to understand it, that our lives would be aligned for your glory. And so God, we thank you. I think the only thing we bring to the equation is what the apostle Paul brought. He used himself, I, me, my, but he said, who will deliver me from this body of death? Oh, wretched man that I am. Lord, for all of us, we need to come to that place. In me, that is, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Help us, Lord, to understand this. According to your riches in Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. The Apostle Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That concept of, of recognizing who he is, that... You know, I, I am a man driven by my passions. I'm a man driven by my desires. And, and for the Christian life, it all begins on the Mount of Beatitudes. It actually begins, when we take a trip to Israel, we're gonna stand on the Mount of Beatitudes where, where Jesus spoke. And I remember I was given the privilege by David Lane and, and the organization to take all the members of the RNC, the Republican National Committee, to Israel, not all of them, uh, 168 of them around the country, and uh, I think over 50 came. And, and when we gathered there, uh, it wasn't like taking a church group. It was an interesting deal. Uh, their trips were paid for, um, but it was an eclectic gathering. You had, you, had, um, you had Protestants, Catholics, Jews, both Reform, conservative, and orthodox. You had atheists and agnostics, homosexuals, Mormons, uh, I think Muslims, and they were all gathered there, and, and they'd taken a free trip to Israel, and so this is the first teaching, and so we gather at the Mount of Beatitudes, and it was almost like, okay, we got our free trip, and here comes the timeshare pitch. <laughs> Serious. And, and I'm there, and they're all looking at me like, you know, and everyone's playing with their phone, and you know, what do you got, what do you got for us, monkey boy? And, um, and I had prayed over this because it was burdensome. And I, how do you reach an eclectic crowd like that, like the bar scene out of Star Wars? How do you do that? <laughs> and, and I began out of a Stephen Mansfield book uh, of the final words of Abraham Lincoln before he died. And uh, he had leaned into his wife, Mary Lincoln, um, as, as uh, John Wilkes Booth was putting the Derringer, Derringer to the back of his head. And there they were in Ford's Theater watching My American Cousin. And he was holding her hand and he leaned in and he said, my dear, when this is all over and this settles, I so want to walk with you in the footsteps of our savior in the streets of Jerusalem. Bang. He got a bullet to the back of his head. 650,000 people died on a field of battle, but the, the scourge of slavery was lifted from the warp and the woof of the fabric of our country. And I looked at all these folks of a party that has lost its bearing and its direction. And I said, you know, it was, it was 19 people in a congregational church in Rapon, Wisconsin that gathered to start this party. And it was a prayer meeting. And they gathered for the sole purpose of abolishing slavery. Everyone laughed at them. You had the Whig Party and the Democratic Party. Democrats were fully engaged in slavery. Actually, our founding fathers had already calculated that it would be removed from our country, but it was Calhoun and Jackson that had brought slavery back in. And I said, and they were tired of it. So these abolitionists gathered together in a church in Rapon, Wisconsin in a prayer meeting. And you can do your own history. I mean, we have revisionist history, but just look at the original documents. Every seceding document of the Southern states was all about slavery. They said it was about states' rights. That's a lie. It was about slavery. 
And these people were sick of it. They were sick of the Supreme Court saying it was legal. They were tired of it. And so they gathered and everyone laughed at them. And that was in 1854. By 1860, they had an influx in the House and the Senate. And they got a, they got a president elected by the name of Abraham Lincoln. And everyone laughed at Abraham Lincoln. He was the most reviled president. He didn't even think he'd win a second term. He was so convinced he wouldn't win a second term that he was going to lose to McClellan, a Democrat, that was going to seal the, the line, the Mason-Dixon line, and anyone south of the Mason-Dixon line would remain, that was black would remain slave, and anyone who was north would remain free. And Lincoln knew that he was going to lose re-election, and so he called Frederick Douglass into the White House, the first black man invited into the White House who wasn't in as a, as a servant or a slave, but was invited in as a human being seeking counsel uh, for the president. And he said to Frederick Douglass after a long conversation, he said, could you get everyone you know to go south of the Mason-Dixon line and get every black man and woman north because when McClellan wins, he's gonna seal the border. And Douglass said at that point, I realized he, he saw me as a man. And, and of course, Sherman gets down to Atlanta, splits, splits the south. The war takes on a, a new dynamic and, and Lincoln wins re-election. The war is ended. He's spending time at Ford's Theater and all of a sudden a bullet to the back of his head. He had been actually raised and he had, uh, in the backwoods of Kentucky and Illinois. And uh, his, his mother was the only Bible teacher in his family. His father was a legalistic Baptist that was just na nauseating and he hated his father, never spoke of him. His first mother died of milk disease and his second mother died as well. But they had both instilled in him a love for the Lord. But when he got into a, a, a stage in his early early adult life as an attorney with a man by the name of William Herndon, he strayed away from the Lord and became a, uh, an atheist and, and a, a militant atheist. And he would write books and the like. And it wasn't until he got into office that he came to know Christ. Elizabeth Keckley, who was a mulatto, half black, half white, um, was, was also the, a, a dressmaker and attendant to Mary Lincoln, would often look over his shoulder in the office of the presidency and see him reading the book of Job, which was dog-eared and and he would be lamenting and, and seeking God in prayer. And she said he prayed often. And he's actually, of all the presidents in the United States, if you see his first inaugural address, second inaugural address, he uses more scripture than any president ever. Today, the ACLU would have a, a conniption over that. And, and, and through this, and coming to Christ, I, I looked at all of these RNC members. And they, they were hardcore, heavy drinking, a lot of them. And it's a party that I'm struggling with, quite honestly. I've been a member of it since I was a child just because my mom and dad. And I looked out at them and I said, you know, you're the founding president of this party had been drinking from the streams of liberty his whole life and he longed to come to its source. And he never got to come. But here you are at the source of liberty where Christ said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. This idea of not being bound by the law of sin and death, but the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, not serving a capricious God on a rat wheel of life, trying to appease him, but coming to a place where when you honor him and you serve him and you receive his gift of salvation and you're justified, then he sanctifies you to bless mankind. You're now at a place where the source exists and for the next 10 days, you can drink deeply from it. And sure enough, over the course of those 10 days, lives were changed. People came to Christ. So many were baptized in the Jordan. And, and they would write letters to David and myself uh, just saying how, how, how much it impacted their lives. I say this because when you come to a place where you're confronted with you being on the throne of your life or the Lord being on the throne of your life, we tend to think that there's power in the political process. There's no power but that which God has given you. We tend to elevate worldly things and think that this is what life is all about. But it's amazing, the older you get, the more you realize how little in control you are. And it begins to slip through your fingers the older you get. I look at my daughters and I see young men coming to, you know, vie for their attention. And I'm thinking, well, I can fight them off only so long. Soon I'm going to have to yield to one of them. And say, well, I'm looking, you know, that's why I gave up to Micah. The guy's got guns on him. I just, I thought, take, take her, take her. I, I, I got no beef with you, man. But it begins with all of us. We have to come to a place where we're broken. We have to come to a place where we realize this struggle, we can't overcome it. We have the anxiety, we have the fear, we have the doubt, we have the worry, we have the consternation, we have the struggles, this battle that rages, the things we wanna do, we don't do, the things we don't wanna do, those we're doing, the secret aspects of our life, God forbid that anyone ever find out about them and, and we live in this world that is just tormenting us. 
And that's why Jesus on the Mount of Beatitudes began by laying a foundation and any contractor knows that the building is only as strong as its foundation. And the only way to pour a strong foundation is to get to bedrock because we know a number of these housing units that were built in the early 50s and 60s were uh, bad rebar and bad foundations and they cracked and the whole house tends to shift and twist and, and you almost have to tear it out to have anything that's valuable. Well, Jesus begins with that foundation on the Mount of Beatitudes, chapter five of Matthew, I'll read it to you. You don't need to turn there. He just says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain and when he was seated, and I love this part, he didn't say this to the world. He says his disciples came to him. This is a sermon for Christians. His disciples come to him and he opens his mouth and he begins teaching the Christians. And he says, let me, let me begin with the foundation of this home we're about to build. He says, blessed, which means, oh, how happy. Oh, how happy are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This whole Christian walk begins when you and I come to a place where we say, God, I can't do this. To will is present in me, but how to do it, I do not know. I'm poor in spirit. I, I, I've got the soma and I've got the psyche, but the pneuma is absent, this trichotomy. I've been trying to will and to try to make it happen. I've been trying to do what is right, but man, am I screwing it up. And oh, how happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's just simply this. The way you pour a firm foundation in Christ is to declare, God, without you, I can't do it. I'm a wretched man. I don't have an ability to do this apart from you. And Jesus says, at this point, what happens when you come to this place where you're poor in spirit, you begin to mourn your wretched condition. Like Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. You're burdened by it. You're sickened by it. Blessed are those. Oh, how happy are those who mourn. He says, for they shall be comforted. I get it. You, you'd struggle over this. You're, you're sick of all that you've done. You're mourning your past. You're mourning all these things. You're mourning all the areas that you've screwed up. I'm gonna comfort you. And then it says, oh, how happy are the meek. Meek, the word meek is a Greek word that means it's a bit in a horse's mouth. This enormous beast is guided by a small piece of metal. And a pull to the right and the horse goes this, and a pull to the left, the horse goes this way. Small piece of metal controls a beast. And the Bible says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. When I'm going to direct you and you submit to my gentle moving in your life, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein. I'll bless you in abundance. He's just building on each of these. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is that idea. God, I want to be set apart for good. I'll take care of that. Blessed are the merciful. God, I realize that the only thing I could ever receive from you if I was going to live was mercy, not getting what I deserved. And if I'm going to receive it from you, I got to give it to one another. It's amazing how judgmental we are of others. We attack their character. We attack their person. We attack them as though somehow it makes us feel better. Do you realize the only thing that you have from God is that you were given mercy? You, you're not getting what you deserve. And then you stand in judgment of others. The Bible says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. To the level you judge, you will be judged. You want to be critical? Be careful. You're going to be in a lot of trouble. And it creates this humbleness. And that's why it says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. There's a tenderness about you. A man who's been saved by God, a woman who's been saved by God is merciful and pure in heart. And then they become peacemakers. They overlook offenses. They work to draw people towards Christ. Peace isn't the absence of conflict. Truth will always demand co confrontation. But it doesn't have to be visceral and divisive. The idea is the presence of Christ in the midst of it. And you're in complete control when you're doing good. Even Christ on the cross, though the nails held him to the cross, the truth is the nails didn't hold him. You think nails can hold God? It was his willingness to die for you. He sacrificed himself. He was a lamb silent to the slaughter. He could have commanded legions of angels to wipe us out. It was his love. Love commands that we step into the fray, that we endure all the pain and the suffering. It says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil falsely for, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. You may not even get anything nice on this earth. You're just gonna get people dumping on you and saying awful things about you, but you keep doing it because it's the right thing to do. And so Paul lays this out. 
And, this, and, and as, Paul, excuse me, as Jesus lays out this foundation, Paul elaborates on it in Romans 7. And he does it in the sense where all of us, and I, and I like this because this is an Obama speech through and through. He's honest enough to recognize within himself a tendency to get caught in the stranglehold of sin. You know, we think of the great apostle Paul that he just floated everywhere. <clears throat> and he was above all that. I mean, he's an apostle. The holy apostle Paul. He was a wretch. He said it himself. And in the passage, for we know. He's including himself. For any of those of you who think that somehow in this Christian walk, we are going to overcome sin and walk in purity for the remainder, that is a lie. You're getting people on that rat wheel again. It's never gonna happen. Sin may be the exception and not the rule, but there will always be sin. There will always be sin. And the room will always be filled with sinners and people struggling. And Paul says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. And the word carnal in all the scripture, this Greek word for carnal is only used for Christians. It means I have a flesh nature. I've got this idea that I'm sold under sin. It applies to us as believers. For what I'm doing, I don't understand. I don't get it. God, I, I, used, to, I used to not ever care about sin. It was all I wanted. It's all about me and I'm gonna use people and, and I, 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 I go to sleep at night and I'd rest well. And then I came face to face with you. You screwed it all up. You showed me that there was good and there was evil and there was right and there was wrong and there's absolutes and we're governed by them and we have some sort of accountability. All of a sudden I realized it and I died the guilt. And I tried medications apart from you and those didn't work. It just made me numb and drool. I just sit there like this. I feel really good. I'm happy. I'm the happiest person I know. And I need one to sleep and one to wake up. My body would break down. I just don't understand this. And then, and then I would see and I could testify that your law was good and the things are right. And, and I agree that, that there are absolutes and, and there are physical laws that govern us. And I recognize that. And I recognize that they're good. And I want to do what is right. For what I will to do, that I don't practice. I, I. And what I hate, I do. And then if I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. I agree the law is good, but I can't do it. And I want to, but I can't. And I even enter into the political process with I wanting to do the right thing. And then I end up I, and I'm listening to people in Congress and Senate where they just surround them with all kinds of temptations and all these opportunities. And, and the things that they entered in with the purpose of wanting to do good, they don't. And that's why the Bible says pray for those in positions of authority. We have one thing with the Oakmont Senior Center. I've gotten more letters than the Pope has appointments in relation to this. And everybody's got an opinion. And they're angry. And, and you're the butt of their jokes and you're the butt of their conversations. They have roast rob. Every... And if you don't, you know, side on their half or whatever, they just go nuts. And the Bible says, instead of whining and complaining, why don't you pray for them? Ask God to give them wisdom. I labor over this. It's, it's easy for anyone to make a, an assessment, but... Do you realize the burden that you put somebody in to make a, a decision? And Michelle loves it that she's married to me. Oh, why don't you do that? Well, I, why do I have to do it? Because you're, you're, the, you're the husband. <laughs> and she likes that she can defer to me for those decisions. And I make it. She goes, I don't know if that was it. Well, you asked me. You back off now, okay? Because I made it. <laughs> All head full. <laughs> but I think about the sin that we struggle with in our lives. And it's such a grip on us. It becomes so tight. And, 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 and I, let's just stop for a minute. I agree that the law is good. For that, I will to do, I don't practice. Now let's take an honest assessment. Quietly, in our own mind. Nobody blurred out. Much like that preacher from seminary that had the deep secret. What do you got? It's there, isn't it? You know who you are. You know what you're struggling with. It's got a grip on you. It's got you filled with guilt and condemnation. You hear that voice over and over again, whether it's your parents or your classmates or the kids that used to pick on you or your siblings. You'll never amount to anything. 
God will never forgive you. You said you wouldn't do it again and you keep doing it. Why would God want anything to do with you? I can tell by the silence that you hear the same voice as I do. I feel them too and you get to a place where you think you're beyond forgiveness. There was a famed psychiatrist, his name was Carl Menninger. He once said, if he could convince the patients in the psychiatric hospitals that their sins were forgiven, he said 75% of them could walk out the next day. Think of all the things you've done. But the truth is, you aren't the only one who's done them. Look around the room. Everybody's guilty. We're all in it together. Sin happens to all of us. Early in the passage of Romans, Paul said, we've all sinned, there's none righteous, no, not one. But he's taking time in chapter seven to say it's personally affecting me. And I wanna use me as an example so that you don't elevate me. He says, in me, nothing good dwells. You wanna elevate man? You wanna take the pastor and say, well, I'm better than the pastor? Paul's saying, too stinking bad. I picked him because he's worse than all of you. So you're without excuse. You can make yourself better by making fun of me. But God says that doesn't work. You can make yourself feel better by comparing yourself to me, but that doesn't work. That's why I love letting you know who I am. So you are without excuse. Makes me feel better. <laughs> All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the personal effect Paul is declaring in chapter seven is what it's done to him. And he just says, listen, and I love this. You just want to boil it down to the simplicity. He says, look, I struggle with sin, Paul says. I struggle with sin. And sometimes... I lose. Now, for some of you read the scripture, you go, no, 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 not Paul. He said it. I struggle with sin and sometimes I lose. And that frustration, look at verse 22. For I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, my body, my parts, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Right? How do I get out of this mess? I'm stuck. Truth be known, there are times when there is condemnation. Yeah, I know we read in Romans 1 and I had us pause there. There's now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The truth is, the truth is, let it be known that there are times when there is condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There are Christians in this room that are under condemnation right now. But I have to tell you something. The condemnation doesn't come from God. It comes from Satan, the enemy of your soul. The word Satan means accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren. He likes to remind you of your past. He wants you to believe that you're condemned. He wants to try to convince you that you're condemned. He gets you into this trap of believing that you're so wretched that God wants nothing to do with you and he puts you into this island all by yourself and he dumps on you. It's like Adam and Eve in the garden. They sin and they're trying to hide from God. And God says, where are you? Not like he didn't know where they were. He wanted them to admit, we're hiding from you. Why? Because we sinned. I know. All things are laid bare before my eyes. I saw you do it before you did it. I see you hiding fig leaves. Really? <laughs> Let me give you something cool like animal skins. Why animal skins? Because it's ultimately going to be my son's blood that covers your sins. And by faith, you're going to trust me. And the only way to get an animal skin is to take its blood from it. Because blood must be shed for the remission of sin. It's the life force. It's, it's capital punishment. But I'm not going to let you die. I'm going to let my son die in your place. Now, where are you? And what have you done? Confess it. Be poor in spirit. Declare to God, I am a sinner. Is that so hard? Or do you want to hide from God and drug yourself up? I love this story. It's touching. A little boy was visiting his grandparents and he was given his first slingshot. That's always dangerous. He practiced in the woods with a slingshot and he could never hit the target and he came back to grandma's backyard and he spied her pet duck. Oh. 
Mark. And on an impulse, he took aim and he let it fly and the stone hit. And the duck fell dead. Oh. It's just a story. Settle down. And the boy panicked. He panicked. And desperately, he hid the dead duck in the wood pile. Only to look up and see his sister watching. Sally had seen it all, but she said nothing. Just, hmm, isn't that pleasant? Kind of like the church lady. Hmm. <laughs> and after lunch that day, Grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. And Sally said, Johnny told me he wanted to help in the kitchen today, Grandma. <laughs> didn't you, Johnny? <laughs> and she whispered to her brother, remember the time. It was more like, remember the dog. <laughs> so Johnny did the dishes. <laughs> Later, Grandpa asked if the children could go fishing. And Grandma said, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help make supper. Sally smiled and said, oh, that's all taken care of, Grandma, because Johnny wanted to help with supper. Remember the dog. <laughs> Johnny stayed while Sally went fishing. Finally, after several days of Johnny doing both his chores and Sally's, he couldn't stand it any longer. And weepingly, he confessed to Grandma that he had killed the duck. She says, I know, Johnny. She said, giving a big hug. I was standing at the window. I saw the whole thing. I forgave you at that very moment because I love you. I was wondering how long you would allow Sally to make a slave of you. <laughs> Sin enslaves us. God's forgiveness frees us. You'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. God's come that you might have life. You're not under the law of sin and death if you receive Christ as your savior. Sin enslaves us. Forgiveness frees us. What have you done? God already knows. He watched it from the window. When are you gonna confess it so that you can walk in the newness of life? Seek forgiveness. He already knows. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Meditate on that. He already saw it from the window. He already forgave you. Why are you letting Sally keep you a slave? You see, we act according to who we believe ourselves to be. You think that you're that old man. God says, no, you're a new creature in Christ. You think that You've always done that. You'll always have to do that. And God says, no, I've come to set you free. You're a new creature in Christ. You're deceived into thinking God wants nothing to do with you. God is here to tell you that I don't remember what you're talking about. Let's move on. You're going to keep acting like you've killed the duck and you've got to hide. God says, I saw it all along. When are we going to start living? Why are you being enslaved to do someone else's bidding when you can be doing mine, God says. You have to break this old nature of the past. You have to see yourself as God sees you in his son's righteousness. Confess your sins and God is faithful and just to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. You don't have to be ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power unto salvation for all who would believe. The vastness of the father's love, not only merciful but gracious, takes your trash and he makes it a treasure. And only when you do this will you come to understand what Jesus did for you. And you pause. And you realize you're not only are you loved, but you're forgiven. You're cleansed of all unrighteousness. You're the son of the king. You're the daughter of the king. That's God's promise. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I don't think people believe that. They want to they wanna hide from God. They struggle over it. You go through life depressed. You think, oh, all I got to do is just laugh and whistle by the graveyard. <laughs> just keep the music blaring and driving fast and just living life quick and not slowing down. And, and in the stillness, just to silence those voices that are that still small voice that's trying to bring you to an understanding of, of who you are in the Lord. And you're like, that's not me. I, I'm the player. 
I, I, I'm, I'm all in. Go bigger, go home. And you're just running and, and just throwing them in and shooting them up and driving fast and playing it loud and, and hanging around with happy people who don't want to say anything about any of that. Just hiding the slide as you're just descending. No, oh, but you're laughing. Let's go watch comedians. And what a tragedy, a country, when the politicians become the comedians and the comedians become the politicians. <laughs> we, just, we, we just want to laugh. The story of the, the man who was a nervous wreck and he went to a London doctor. He said, doctor, I'm, I'm a nervous wreck. And the doctor said, you need to laugh more. He says, go down and hear Grimaldi, the famous clown. He's, he's the rage of all of London. All London is holding its sides, laughing at him. And the visitor straightened out and said to the doctor, he said, doctor, I am Grimaldi. You know, why do all of our comedians die? Farley, Belushi, the funny fat guy. We just drain him. Because we want somebody to take our burden. We kill him. I quote Tommy Lasorda, although he endorsed my opponent. <laughs> I like him. I like what he says here. You know him to be the former Los Angeles Dodgers manager. He described his battle with bad habits, right? He said, I took a pack of cigarettes from my pocket one day and I stared at it and said, who's stronger, you or me? And the answer was me. And I stopped smoking. And then I took the vodka martini and said to it, who's stronger, you or me? And again, the answer was me. And I quit drinking. And then I went on a diet and I looked at a big plate of linguine and clam sauce and said, who's stronger, you or me? And the little clam looked up at me and answered, I am. I, he says, I can't beat linguine. <laughs> There's some things you'll never have victory over apart from the Lord. You think you do, but you just, you know, it's like I'm, I, you go to an AA meeting and they've overcome alcohol, but they're just all smoking like chimneys out there, just keeping it going, you know? You're just, you're exchanging one for the other. And one doesn't absolutely destroy your family, but it's just killing your lungs. But you know, it's, I'm, I'm getting this done. And you know, praise the Lord for those of you in AA. You're figuring out, you want to do what's right, good. And in the process, so many people have come to Christ. You think it's all these steps? And yeah, I can see the, you know, reconciling with people and admitting your wrongs. Like, I think that's all great. I like the idea of one step. I die, Jesus lives. Now there's little things in part of that where you, you, you take a, an assessment of your life and all those things, but it all begins where you just get off the throne and let Jesus take over. I'm almost finished. I want to just share two stories and close with the last portion of the passage. Because, well, let me just share with you in the passage when Paul says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? It's a fascinating picture that uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon wrote. And he, he laid out that it used to be the practice in, in ancient kingdoms that if you were caught murdering somebody and, and, and the body was present and you had, you had killed the person, the punishment that the king would enact is they would take the corpse of the person you killed and they would tie it to you. They would, you know, strap the face to your face and the arms to your arms and the legs to your legs and they'd wrap it really tight, you know, so that you couldn't undo it. And you'd just be walking around with this dead corpse just staring in the stench of it. And yeah, isn't that lovely? And you're like, <laughs> in the Middle Eastern sun as the heat was bearing down, this thing's just turning all colors and dripping on you and <laughs> flies. <laughs> and then things are, you know, and they get, you know, hell, right? And, and, and that's us. We're just dragging around this old man, just dragging him around. And, and that's who you are apart from Christ. You're just rotting corpse of flesh. Oh, I'm not rotting. Yeah, you are. Every morning you wake up, you try to stop the rot. You brush your teeth and, you know, whatever you can to make the smell go away. And you don't think you're rotten. Just ask the person who's with you in the morning. They're like, oh, oh okay. You are dying. Right? And we're born to die, and we just start to slowly decrepitate. <laughs> and you're just dragging around this fleshly body, just bleh, bleh. 
and, and you know, people come up and, and you, you, you want to greet them and you don't, you don't want them to sit, you're like, hi, how are you? <laughs> you want to get that profile. And so you're even practicing your profile in the mirror. This side's too wrinkly, so you're, you know, just trying to make it nicer. You're practicing the smile, you know, putting the portion of your face that's not, is rotten. And that's us. And, and, and we're dragging around this. And, and Paul knew what he was saying when he said, who will deliver me from this body of death? How do I get this mess off me? He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. This, I just want this flesh off me. I just, I just, with my mind and my heart and my soul, I want to dictate to my body what it's supposed to do. And, and he says, but the guilt always brings me back to being tied to this guy. I'm, I'm always reminded that, that this is what I did. I killed this man. And Satan puts you right back in that rat wheel. And that's why Paul says in Romans 8, 1, he breaks through the, the, the as, as Paul said in all of Romans 7, I, I, me, me, me. And he's just showing who he is. And he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then Romans 8, 1, he just jumps through and he just says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Lord comes in, just cuts off this flesh and just, you're like, oh God, I can't wait to take a bath. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You get the maggots off you and everything else. You're like, oh, this is so much better. And it is. And every time you fail and that body gets back on, confess it, he cuts it off. Keep walking. Last story, I said two, but I'm out of time. I'll let you meditate on this. You guys remember General Jonathan Wainwright? He was the one who was um, imprisoned by the Japanese. And MacArthur went off and he said, I shall return. And he went off on the boat and left General Wainwright to take care of all the Philippine soldiers. He goes on the Badan death march and he's the one who's pummeled. And, and, and MacArthur lands and puts his foot on and takes a picture with his pipe and his sunglasses. And then you, you see Wainwright and he's just emaciated. And they had beaten the daylights out of Wainwright. He was a prisoner in a Manchurian concentration camp and he was cruelly treated. And, and Wainwright had become broken and crushed and he was starving. And finally the Japanese surrendered and the war ended and the Japanese army colonel was sent to the camp where Wainwright was to announce personally to the general that Japan had been defeated and that he was free and in command. And after Wainwright heard the news, he goes back to his barracks and the news hadn't gone through all the barracks, but he goes back to his barracks into his quarters and he was confronted by some of the Japanese guards who began to mistreat him as they had done in the past and Wainwright stopped and with the news of the Allied victory fresh in his mind, he declared his authority. He said, I am in command here. These are my orders. And at that moment, he said, back down. And the Japanese backed down. And the author that, that does this in a book, his name was F.J. Hegel. He said, have you been informed of the victory of your savior in the greatest conflict of the ages? Then rise up and assert your rights. Never again go under when the enemy comes to oppress, claim the victory in Jesus' name. We must learn to stand on resurrection ground, reckoning dead the old creature and the old creation life over which Satan has power and living in the new creation over which Satan has no power. You're a new creature in Christ. You're walking around with this body of death and you do that by your guilt and your condemnation. And the Lord says, I've sanctified you and set you apart. And there's no condemnation. Just cut it off. I've already forgiven that. I don't remember what you're talking about. Cut it off. Let's move on. And align with his word and his spirit to dictate to your mind what your body will do. And this is the power of what Paul's saying. The only place <clears throat> where you want to spend an enormous amount of time talking about yourself is revealing what a mess you are. And that's what Paul did in, in Romans 7. I can't do this. I have no ability. I, I, I. But God... And now there's no condemnation. I don't care, listen, I don't care what you've done. Better than that, God doesn't care what you've done and where you've been. Even if it's today and a few moments ago, he has forgiven you. And he's cast your sin as far as the east is from the west and you receive that by faith. And that fleshly monster that's tied to you of the guilt that you've done has been cut off. 
and you confess your sins and he's faithful and just to cleanse you of all unrighteousness and all the maggots are washed off and all the death and the skin and everything is washed off and you walk in the newness of life. I remember when I was a young minister and a woman came to me and they'd found her brother's body. He'd hung himself in the forest up in the hills of San Jose. And they cut his body down. They gave his belongings to his sister and they were in a bag. And she showed up at the church. She said, this is all I have of my brother. I said, well, let's take a look at him. She says they were on his person and his body was rotten. I said, well, let's take a look at him. And I pulled him out and I'll never forget, and I'm gonna be graphic here. I pulled him out and his glasses were there. She said, he wore those everywhere. She says, I wanna keep them, but the skin was stuck to the, mat, to the glasses. And I said, well, let's, and I put on some gloves. I said, let's take care of that, dear. And I walked in, I washed them all off and I disinfected them and I brought them out and I said, they're all clean. And she held those. They were new to her and the stench of death was past and only the memories of the future lay with her. And I would say to all of you, forget what is behind, cut off that body of death. There's no condemnation. Walk in the newness of life. You recognize that every time that you step into that old fleshly life, it just gets strapped back on you. Confess it, cut it off, cleanse yourself, and move on. We're here to live, not to die. We live to Christ. We already died. It's time for Christ to live. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you for the picture that Paul gives us so clearly but Lord, there are still some in this room that have never come to a faith in Christ. They're walking around with this dead man strapped to them. They're trying to dress it up and cover it and make it seem as though it's fine. They walk through life with a poison viper's mouth and just judgment and anger towards others. And somehow just trying to get through life with this condemnation and misery and they're empty inside and they're dying. There's not enough drugs on the planet to make them feel better. Not enough alcohol. The music can't go loud enough. But in the stillness of this room, they've come face to face with this idea that there's a God who's ready to forgive and cut that man off of them so that they can walk cleansed and righteous. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your tongue that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. That this, this cleansing, this righteousness comes by faith that you receive Christ as your savior and say, God, cleanse me, forgive me. Sin enslaves us, forgiveness frees us. God has already seen from the window what we did. It's time to let him forgive you. If you desire to have the forgiveness of God, that it can only come through his son Jesus and the cleansing of his son's blood. Or you wanna stand in your own merit with the stench of who you are before a holy God. God forbid. He doesn't want you to be there. He wants you to be cleansed by the blood of his son. If you want to receive his son by faith, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I would just ask that the act of faith would be that you'd raise your hand to receive him. So if you want to receive the Lord as your savior, you want to be cleansed of all unrighteousness, you don't want to be a slave to sin anymore. God saw from the window, it's just time to confess it and have him forgive you. If you want that forgiveness, would you raise your hand right now? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Over here, God bless you. Praise the Lord. Lord, thank you for those who've given their life to you. They're new creatures in Christ. The old has passed, the new has come. They've been cleansed of all unrighteousness. And Lord, we're so grateful for that. And so I just ask your blessing upon them now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's clap for those folks who gave their heart to the Lord.